Aloha and welcome to this National Historic Landmark, the headquarters of U.S. Pacific Fleet. My name is Suzanne Varislam, U.S. Army Major General Retired, and I am honored to be here today with the former Commander-in-Chief of the Pacific Fleet during 1994 and to 96, Admiral R.J. Zapp Zlatiper. And many of us, we're both here today and very excited to talk about one of the most significant and consequential figures during World War II, Admiral Chester W. Nimitz. In fact, today we're in a place that's very historic and significant, and we're honored to have someone of Admiral Zapp's experience to talk a little bit about this place. Admiral, thank you so much for being here. And I wondered if you could tell us, is this the actual room or office for Admiral Nimitz? Well, this is the annex room to enter into his office. It's the reception room. And this is actually his, the desk he sat at from 1941 when he came in here until he left to go to Guam in 1945. And this is his desk and it's reconstructed in exactly the same format. We have the painting done during, right after World War II of him. And if you'll notice, he's got the CBs, Construction Battalion, became very important, so he kept that on his desk. He had his magnifying glass to read things, and a picture of the F S6F Hellcats, which were such an important part, and the, the letter opener and the seal that he used to sample everything. Most interestingly, though, General, was the fact he had a picture of Douglas MacArthur on his desk. And there's an anecdotal story to go with this. Uh, when, when I was a Pacific Fleet commander, we found the, the man that had been his aide while he was here. We brought him out here and we walked around for a week with him. And I asked him, I said, I thought Adam uh, Nimitz and General MacArthur didn't get along. He said, well, personally, they didn't, and they sort of competed. I said, well, why did he have a picture of General MacArthur on his desk? He said, well, he told me it was because he wanted to remember what it was like to be arrogant. So, and the one thing I think you can say about Admiral Nimitz, he was not arrogant. He was really a man, a leader, and somewhat aloof, but he was an amazing man. Uh, when he left here, he stayed here, came uh, in December of 1941, after Pearl Harbor, of course, and he came here. This was his enclave, and he stayed here from 1941 through 1945, when he went to Guam for the last six months of the war. After that, he came back, went and became the chief of naval operations for two years, and then back to San Francisco, his home, where he lived a quiet life, and it was very interesting because he started the NROTC program at Berkeley, and from there he became a submariner, became a Pacific Fleet commander, and the rest of this, as we say, history. So here we are in this very historic office. Well, thank you, Admiral, for that. I understand, I've heard from others, that you were pivotal in bringing together a lot of these artifacts that we see not only on this table, but as you walk into this, this foyer here, and also the artifacts on the wall. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Thank you. I would love to, General. They, I will tell you, when I first came, this was my desk. It was back in his office. I sat at the same desk that he had. And what we did was we found this painting. And I said, I need to reconstruct this desk the exact way that Admiral Nimitz had it. And this is the desk I worked from for three years. And at the time, we didn't have all this wonderful memorabilia around us. At Admiral Nimitz is from Fredericksburg, Texas. His father died when he was young. His grandfather was sort of the man that became his altar father. And he wanted to go to West Point, but he could not get an appointment to West Point. So he got one to the Naval Academy, and of course then, as we say, the rest is history. But Fredericksburg has adopted Admiral Nimitz as its own, and there's a wonderful museum of them. So I sent my public affairs officer down to Texas, and I said, see if they, are, they have some things in storage we could have. And they actually opened their doors to us, and we had a chance to bring back all this wonderful memorabilia, which includes over here a Battle of Midway chart that Admiral Nimitz actually used with his anecdotal comments written in it, and all the things that went. The picture of 
when Admiral Nimitz entertained uh, President Roosevelt, and General MacArthur, and they talked about World War II and strategy. Uh, pictures of uh, various people that were important to him. But over on this side, even more interestingly, uh, we have the portrait, his official portrait of when he was there. But if you'll notice the horseshoes. Yes. Tell us about the horseshoes. Great story on the horseshoes. As they say, we had his aide who retired as a commander here, and he said, those are the horseshoes that he would, they had a horseshoe pit set up at his quarters, and he would pitch horseshoes every day. Unless the war was going bad, mm -hmm. in which case then he would go to the pistol range just outside right here. Right out here? Right outside the, the headquarters building here, outside the office, and shoot that? the pistol. And actually, it was his, his doctor recommended that he do it to That's steady his nerves, shoot pistols. So the aide said, I could always tell how the war is going today because if we went up to the headquarters, uh, back to the house, and we pitched horseshoes, the war was going well. If we went outside this office and shot the pistol, there were challenges to be had. Extraordinary. Clearly, that helped him to sing. Because yes, exactly. the pivotal decisions that were made, the planning yeah. that happened in yeah. here to change the course of the war right. for the United States and the Pacific. It really did. And, you know, the Battle of Coral Sea was essentially a tactical loss, but it stopped the advance of the Japanese. And then, of course, a couple months later, the Battle of Midway turned the tide completely. That was a victory for the United States. And it was his planning, that's his chart over there, that allowed the tide of the war to turn in the Pacific. After that battle in Midway, the Japanese withdrew from the expansion node and went into defensive mode. Then, of course, four years later, we, on September 2nd, 1945, the surrender was signed. With, very interestingly, General MacArthur overseeing the event, but Admiral Nimitz signing for the United States. So they came together at the end also. And certainly sitting in Tokyo Bay, but right now the battleship Missouri sits in Pearl Harbor. And I noticed one of our, our artifacts on here it seems to be a tray from the, the Arizona. Exactly right. That part, and, and all of the photos, letters, and material that are here. And you'll notice that even though it was a war against Japan, when the war was over, Nemesis didn't harbor hateful thoughts about his best enemy. They, they moved on to, uh, you can see letters and, and calligraphy that uh, the Japanese provided to him and that he collected. And today, our strong ally here at the end of the exactly. key, key um, partner. Exactly right. Everything that we're doing. Good. Yeah, at, at this time, I've always said that the 21st century is the century of the Pacific, and our strongest ally out here are our former enemies that Admiral Nimitz and General MacArthur fought against are now a strong support to the United States of America in the region. Extraordinary. Yeah. Admiral, you know, having sat and being a, a combat veteran yourself, being in this position as a commander of the Pacific Fleet, of this vast, incredible region, knowing that you came after Admiral yeah. Nimitz, I just wondered, how did he inspire you as you were commanding? You could share with us. I would. You know, it's very interesting. His, his home up is 250 Makalapa. That was built in four months when he was here. His wife never came out. He, he lived there with his chief of staff and some other officers. But when I came out as Pacific Fleet Commander, my wife came with me, and we lived in that house. And my wife had said it always, you can feel his spirit. She believes that. His spirit is there. And when I sat at this desk, it was the same thing. And, and you know, they always say, if you're doing something, this might sound somewhat negative, don't mess it up. But that's the spirit you have. When I sat at this desk, I said, this man changed the course of the world during the Second World War. Zap, you're being blessed to be a successor of him. Don't mess it up. And, you know, there were a couple of times where I have to say, I tend to be a little more enthusiastic than the average person. And I would have to say, wait a minute. Admiral Chester Nimitz was a man of thoughtful action. And slow down and spend some thought and before you take action without thinking. And there's no question that that affected the way that I behaved during the three years I was out here. Extraordinary, Admiral. 
You know, you've brought up some things, thoughtful, quiet spirit. And I, I, I found it amazing when I look back in history and he said at the joint congressional meeting where they asked him to speak and he said that he was merely a representative of the brave men who served under his command and that he ended, urged us to ensure and he prayed that we would not be unprepared for a future war. I, I wondered if you could share um, you know, your thoughts on something I, and like that. It's very, very deep and philosophical for a military officer to testify that way. It's very true. And that's where we find ourselves right now, at a time when some people say, well, we should engage and go forward. Well, let's stop before we go to a war and think about our, the consequences. You know, you brought up, uh, so I'm going to fall back to an old story. Yeah, he, uh, he had lost a finger when, when in, in a submarine accident. But more importantly, he almost lost his career because he actually ran his destroyer aground. He ran into a mud bank as a, a young lieutenant, which would have been nowadays, you know, run your ship aground, your career is over. That, they gave him a chance. And look what happened. And look what the United States of America benefited from because of it. And that alone was something that made a big difference to me is you can make a mistake, give the person a second chance. And that's always been at the back of my mind since I knew anything about Nimitz, and I've done a lot of reading about it. Thank you, Admiral. Those are some powerful words from some, a man of your experience and an admiral who served our country so proudly, and we're so proud of everything that you've done and how you've allowed us to remember Admiral Nimitz. Any advice or thoughts as to why we should reflect? These artifacts re reflect history, reflect some very complex and challenging times. But what would you say to the, the audience out there about why we should reflect on the work? Well, it's that? interesting, I, General. The, the thought I have is you've often heard people say, well, history repeats itself. I'm not sure if that's true. Mm. But the, the, the anecdotal way to handle it is history may not repeat itself, but it rhymes. And it sounds Good an, awful, one, an <laughs> awful lot like the past. So there's a reason if, if you're... If you don't learn from the past, you're doomed to suffer failure in the future. And there, therefore, there is great value in this room and in what that man has done and what we can learn for the future, especially now at this rather unsettled time in the Asia-Pacific region. Thank you, Admiral. My pleasure. And uh, I think this was a, a, a great opportunity to hear from you, and I thank everyone for joining us today, and I hope that you'll find out more about Admiral Chester W. Nimitz, an incredible man who turned the tide for the United States in the Pacific War during World War II.